running water. How neat is that? This video is going to be all about the water system in my camper van. Let's jump right in. Okay, so first of all, you're going to need tanks for holding both clean water and dirty water. When you talk about campers, there's three types of tanks. Fresh water, gray water, and black water. Fresh water tanks hold the clean water that's coming out of your faucet. Gray water tanks hold the dirty water that's draining down from your sink. And black water tanks hold wastewater from toilets. For a setup like this, the fresh water tank and gray water tanks are going to be a must. But I'd recommend getting a self-contained composting toilet, and then you don't have to mess with the black water tank at all. Now what I want to do is walk through building out a system, looking at the components I used and what some other options are. This will start with the fresh water tank, going through the pump and water delivery, and then through to the gray water collection. For the fresh water tanks, you can either go with a large fixed tank or you can go with smaller, more portable tanks. I went with a large fixed 25 gallon tank. You can find these tanks in a variety of sizes and shapes, both larger and smaller. The easiest way to fill a tank like this is by adding a fill port. These can be mounted on the exterior of the van, but in my case, I didn't want to cut another hole in the van for this or have it showing on the outside, so I opted to mount this inside, just inward of the rear door. I made a mistake though when I installed my fill port, and that's I didn't get it mounted high enough above the top of the tank. This means that when I'm driving around and the water's sloshing around, or if you're going up a hill and the water's pushed backwards, some of that water is actually able to splash back out through the fill port. And that's partially due to the, the cap on the fill port also not being able to secure tight enough to prevent this water from splashing out. If the fill port were mounted on the exterior of the van, it wouldn't really matter if a little bit of water could splash out, but on the inside, you don't want this. Due to this, I actually got an adapter so I can just hook my fill hose up directly to the tank, but I don't think this is an ideal solution either. What I'd recommend is using a fill port, but just keeping in mind that you have it mounted high enough and a cap that secures tight enough so that water can't splash back out of that port. With a large fixed tank, you can locate it inside the van or you could mount it underneath the van. If it's underneath the van, then you really have to worry about freezing temperatures. If it's inside the van, then you still have to worry about freezing temperatures, but as long as you're in here and running the heater regularly, it's pretty easy to keep the temperature inside well above freezing. And in that case, you don't have to worry about it so much unless you're going to leave the van parked in freezing temperatures without heat for, you know, a little bit. And then you'll want to empty the tank and drain the lines and properly winterize it. I wanted to be able to travel, you know, through the winter, through the mountains in cold weather in our van. So I opted to put the tank on the inside, even though it takes up a considerable amount of space in the back. So the other option for fresh water is to use one or many small portable tanks, something like this. With these, how much water you carry and where you store them becomes a lot more flexible. The other difference is with how you fill them. With a large fixed tank in the van, you have to bring the water to the tank. So this means you also need to carry a hose and you always need to be able to park within that hose's length to the water spigot. With a small portable tank that you can take out and carry, you can bring that to a water source, fill it up, then carry it back to the van. And that means your options for filling the tanks become a lot more flexible. Water can get heavy, so carrying those small tanks back and forth can become a little inconvenient. But the other really nice thing about small portable tanks is they're much easier to clean. You can just fill them with some cleaning solution, shake it all around, dump it out, and you're done. With a big fixed tank, it's a little more of a process to clean the whole thing. What I like about having one big fixed tank is just being able to carry a lot of water and go many days without having to refill or swap out water containers. Next, let's talk about all the connections to the tank and start to build out a diagram. I'm going to use a large tank like mine in the example, but it could look similar with a smaller container as well. So we already talked about the fill port. The other connection at the top of the tank is a vent tube. As water is drained from the tank or as the tank is filled, air needs to be able to move in and out of the tank. And that's what the purpose of the vent tube is. Just like the fill port, the end of the vent tube should be located sufficiently above the tank so water can't splash out of this tube while driving. Many fill ports have a little spot on the back where the air tube can be connected and held in place. At the bottom of the tank, you want to have a drain line with a valve. Having an easy way to empty the tank will help with both cleaning and winterizing the system. The tank I used has threaded fittings built in, two that are one and a half inch in diameter and two that are half inch. The two larger ones are for the fill port and the drain line. 
and the two smaller ones are for the vent tube and the pump line. If you want to view this diagram I've been showing for reference later, I'll put a link in the video description to my website, which will have two different versions of the diagram. The version I'm showing here, which is a little bit of a simpler version and doesn't show every single plumbing connection fitting, and then a more detailed version with those details. Alongside that, I'll also provide a list of all the components used in the system. On the tank itself, there's a small problem with the one I used, and that is due to the location of the fill port and it being a little below the top of the tank, you can't fill the tank completely before water starts coming out of that vent tube. Similarly, with the pump connection at the bottom, the pump isn't able to draw out that last little bit of water in the tank. All this really means is that the actual usable capacity of the tank is a little less than what its actual size is. Let's look at the pump components now. So the pump pulls water from the tank and provides pressurized water to the rest of the system. Alongside the pump, it's recommended to use an inline strainer to prevent debris from entering the pump, as well as an accumulator on the output or pressurized side of the system. The accumulator basically helps the pump run smoother. The accumulator helps the system maintain a more consistent pressure. This means that the pump doesn't have to cycle on and off as frequently, which allows it to conserve power, and it also extends the life of the pump. The pump runs on 12 volts. When I wired mine in, I added a switch right here on the side of our sink cabinet, and that allows us to cut power to the pump easily when we're not using it. In the video description, I'll put a link to the pump in the diagram, along with some of the recommended tubing and connections for interfacing with the pump assembly. This is the only pump I have experience with, and I think it works great. I do sometimes wonder though, if it provides a little too much pressure for what we need, especially when we're trying to conserve water at the sink. I'd be interested in the future to test out a pump that has a lower output pressure or a slower gallons per minute rating and see how that works with the faucet. Basically, a setup like I'm showing in this diagram is a very capable system that would support supplying water to faucets, shower heads, other hoses, and whatever you might want to hook up to your camper's water system. It is possible though to have a smaller and simpler water system. For instance, if you wanted to have a simple setup with just a portable tank and a sink, then you could get a submersible pump that is on the end of a tube that you just stick down into the tank and that draws the water up to the sink. Or if you wanted to go with a really low power setup, they also make hand pumps or foot pumps that don't require an electrical connection at all. The hand pumps and foot pumps also really help if you're trying to conserve water because it doesn't just readily flow out. So just some things to keep in mind when you're figuring out what kind of water system you want in your van. So from here, past the pump and accumulator, we have the pressurized side of the water system. There's a main line that comes off the accumulator and then it branches to two different taps. In my case, this is the kitchen sink faucet, as well as a connection I have in the back where a hose sprayer can be connected for rinsing things off outside. I added a cutoff valve to both of these branches. If you add a hot water heater to your system, this is also where you'd have a line that branches off, goes to the hot water heater, and then there'd be a line coming out of the hot water heater that goes to each of the taps where it's required. Most faucets you buy are gonna have supply lines coming out the bottom that need to be hooked to both a cold water line and a hot water line. If you don't have a hot water line, as it was the case in my setup, then you wanna get a T connection so that both of these supply lines can be connected to the same source. This is important because if you leave that hot water inlet unconnected, then depending on the position of this handle, water can leak out of that hot water supply line. It's also better to join the two lines with a T rather than putting a cap on the end of the hot water line. If you just cap that line, then you create a section of the system where water can become trapped and stagnant. The other thing I added in my plumbing before the faucet is a water filter. We use this water for cooking and drinking and we want it to be as clean as possible. The filter sits at the back of this cabinet down under the sink and it really doesn't take up all that much space in there. The other option is to filter the water before it goes into the tank and they sell filters that screw on to the end of your fill hose and allow you to do this. Now for the tubing. I used PEX tubing with brass fittings for most of the plumbing. PEX has become pretty standard in both residential settings as well as in RVs. It's readily available at most home improvement stores and it's easy to work with. PEX is also a little more resistant to freezing than copper pipe or rigid plastic pipe, but you still need to be careful with it and you still wanna to try to prevent the system from ever freezing. PEX tubing is semi-rigid, but it is a little flexible, 
and this allows you to bend and curve the pipe. Since it is flexible though, you want to make sure the bins as well as any long runs are supported with bin supports or pipe clamps. One really important thing to know about PEX is it's very susceptible to UV damage, so you want to make sure you keep it protected from the sun. There are a couple different types of PEX fittings and connectors. There are brass fittings, which secure with either a clamp ring or a crimp ring, and these need a special tool, or there are push to fit or compression fittings that can be installed without a special tool. The push to fit connectors are really popular due to just how easy they are to install. You just cut the pipe and push it into the connector, and then you're done. I was a little leery of these though in regards to potentially leaking over time. So I bought the clamping tool and went with all clamped connections and brass fittings in my system. These connections were pretty easy to install as well, but what I learned is that the clamp rings are really hard to remove if you ever need to disassemble one of the connections to make any changes to the system. Some alternatives to PEX would be copper pipe or braided vinyl tubing, but PEX has become more standard for these types of systems. If you do use something else though, just make sure that the tubing is food grade or rated for use in potable water systems. Okay, now let's talk about the gray water portion of the system. So all the water that drains down from the sink goes into my gray water tank. And for this, I used a seven gallon aquatainer that sits down underneath the sink cabinet. At seven gallons, the container gets pretty heavy when it's full. But I don't think I'd want to go much smaller than this because then it'd fill up too quickly and it's not always easy to find a suitable place to dump your gray water. Most established campgrounds will have a station where you can discard your gray water, but this isn't the case when dispersed camping. Please don't dump your gray water on the ground willy-nilly without considering its impact to wildlife and the environment. I think having a large gray water tank mounted underneath the van would be quite nice to have, but of course, then you have to worry about it freezing. A hybrid solution where you use a smaller portable container inside the van during cold weather travel and the undermount gray water tank the rest of the time, that might be the ideal solution. Okay, so under the sink, you want to have a drain trap. As with any plumbing system, the purpose of the trap is to prevent the gases and odors from that dirty water container from being able to come up and out of the sink drain. I used the Camco drain trap for RVs, and what's really nice about this one is how low profile it is. And this allows you to use the space just under the drain for cabinets or drawers without that trap interfering. The Camco drain trap comes with a flexible tube and then a connection at the end that fits normal garden hose fittings. And I used garden hose style fittings for the rest of this section. I added a valve and a quick connect connector. The valve is important because when you disconnect the tank to take it out to empty it, you don't want any of that water that's still lingering in the tubing to be able to drip down. So with that valve, you can shut it off and prevent that. And then the quick connect makes it really easy to hook and unhook the tank. Another thing to remember is that this tank also needs an air vent in order for water to drain into it easily. The aquatainer has a little white cap on the back that can be opened as an air vent. The problem is though, is your gray water tank can start to smell a little bit, and you don't want this to be venting into the van if it smells. I ended up adding a vent tube to my gray water tank that passes down through the floor and to the exterior of the van. I used a section of garden hose for this and another quick connect adapter in order to make the vent tube easy to disconnect as well. One thing I didn't show in the diagram because I don't think this will apply to most people is that I actually have a double sink in my van. So this means I actually have two different drains and I have one of those Campco drain traps on each of those and then both those tubes connect together with a T and then it goes into my gray water tank. All right, that's it for this one. You can find the diagram and more on my website. Follow the link in the video description to get there. Subscribe for more videos. Thanks for watching. Bye.